Hi, welcome everyone again to another uh, company analysis video with myself, Moe Damin, and Ted Wayman. So today we're going to be looking at Associated British Foods. Uh, so they are a pretty big company, international business. Uh, they have about five arms, if I'm looking at it now. Um, and essentially, they're involved in things like grocery. Uh, so they do um, manufacturing of grocery-based products. Uh, they are one of the biggest sugar producers in the world, so different types of sugar that they produce. Agriculture, such as feeds and animal feeds, things like that. Uh, ingredients like enzymes and, and, and ingredients that go into the production of food. And also retail. So some people may not know this, they actually own Primark, which is a, a large discount store, a retail store with about 400 stores in 14 countries worldwide, including the USA. So um, we want to thank one of our viewers uh, who are, requested us to analyze this company. Uh, so uh, Sean Dent, thank you for your request. Here is your video. And you know, if you're a subscriber, I'm not talking about just about Sean, he already is, but if you're a subscriber uh, to one of our, to our show, then you will get access to our um, uh, updated company analysis. At the moment we release them, you will get informed of that. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Quick note on the share price before we uh, go into the analysis and stick around to the end because when we go into the share price analysis, obviously after we've done the financial analysis, there's a bit of context there to help you in any future analysis that you're going to be doing, whether it's quarterly based or any of the latest annual reports next year, et cetera. Um, so the share price, um, if you had invested when they'd floated in, in, in 1988, uh, you would be sitting on an increase of 3,671%, benefit of hindsight, although you would have to wait quite a long time to see that return. If you invested five years ago, unfortunately, you'd be down about 46%. And if you invested a year ago, you'd be down 32%. So stick around because we're going to look at that in a bit more detail. Now, just to make a note quickly, um, this show is around helping people become more financially aware and financially savvy. Um, and what we're going to be doing is um, helping you kind of understand this business. So whether you are involved in that investment or selling or whatever it might be, now this is the video for you. So stick around to the end and you'll start to see some great analysis there. So Ted, let's uh, take it away. What have we uh, uncovered? Let's share what we've uncovered about this business and help our viewers analyze a company like this. Good to see you, Moe. Thank you very much. And yes, welcome to all of our viewers. I hope you are all well. Let's go and have a look at Associated British Foods. So here we go. This is their annual report. Now, once again, we are looking at the annual report. And as Moe said, we are looking backwards. So when we talk about share prices, share prices is forward looking, uh, whereas the annual accounts are backward looking. So a little bit out of date, um, but gives you the key numbers and also um, uh, not only gives you the key numbers, but also um, gives you an idea of how to read any quarterly reports that you may want to keep yourself updated with. A lot of information in the annual report as ever. So lots of pretty pictures, but also details about the strategy, the brands, uh, how they're performing, their corporate governance, their board of directors remuneration of the board of directors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we are going to come all the way down to the numbers page. So here, um, here is the numbers page, and we're going to start off with the consolidated income statement. So um, I'm just going to zoom in uh, to this uh, consolidated income statement. There we go. Um, so first thing we notice on the consolidated income statement, so we're looking at the top line here, we're in millions. So there we go. So turnover is 13.9 billion pounds. OK, so 13.9 billion pounds, a little bit down on the previous year. So, you know, it's kind of there or thereabouts. Now, what's interesting about these guys, is that they then give you operating costs. Uh, and, and that's kind of not 100 percent useful for us because we like to split things out between cost of sales and the cost of running the business. So what is the cost of the things that they sell? What are the costs of running the business? Well, uh, in order to find that out, we need to go and look at note number two. So let's just whiz down 
and have a look at note two. Uh, and here you see in note two, um, we see the uh, cost of sales. There's the cost of sales. Um, and then the rest of these are the costs of running the business. Um, now, in terms of the cost of sales, what that is telling us is that these guys are operating at a 23% gross margin. OK, so their profit is 23% of their sales, which basically means every time you buy uh, uh, Moed mentioned Pri Primark or Primani, as it's known in our household. So if you buy a T-shirt from Primani and you pay, I don't know, £10 for a T-shirt, sounds quite a lot for a Primani T-shirt, but if you pay £10 for that T-shirt, it's costing them about £7.70 and p to make the T-shirt and they make the, um, the, the balance um, of £2.30. p. OK, so that's the gross margin. Um, and then the overheads are another 17 percent. So 17 percent on the overheads means that the operating margin, uh, that's the operating profit expressed as a percentage of sales is seven uh, is five percent. Sorry, five percent. So that's that's a pretty low figure. So there's the operating profit seven to five, um, seven to five expressed as a percentage of sales is 5%, exactly the same as the previous year. Um, they've got a little bit of uh, debt. There's the debt. You can see the um, uh, the finance costs. Uh, and then if we scroll down a little bit further, we can see um, the tax um, as well, the tax down the bottom, uh, and leaves them with a net profit of about 500 million pounds. So 500 million on a turnover of nearly 14 billion pounds is a 4% margin. So these guys live in a very, very, very tight uh, uh, margin business. So if you are selling to them, then your ability to sell kind of lo either logistical efficiency at the back end, or products which are cheaper than anybody else's, uh, which still have reasonable quality in them uh, at the front end, um, is, is going to be a, a key point to that. So really, really tight margin, 4%, 3% in the previous year, 4% this year, very, very tight margins. And that's kind of reflection uh, of that industry. That's what we would expect to see. So there we go. There is our, our, our profit and loss account. Um, if we go look at the balance sheet, so the balance sheet, we've got our non-current assets. These are the things we need to run the business. Um, uh, and the biggest number there is the plant and machinery. So there's the plant and machinery. And then they've got a whole lot of uh, right of use assets, which is effectively like plant machinery, but rather than buying it, they leased it. That's absolutely fine. Um, uh, and then the intangible assets will be predominantly goodwill, um, which will be, uh, you know, arise on the acquisition of some of their brands. So these guys have grown and they've bought, uh, uh, they've bought existing brands rather, than, you know, they've developed some brands in house, but a lot of it will have been acquired, will have been bought. Uh, in terms of the uh, current assets, uh, uh, as we'd expect, so inventory is quite a big part, trade and other receivables, and they've got quite a lot of cash. So 2.3 billion of cash uh, up from 2 billion the previous year. So, um, you know, they've got a lot of cash and, and that's, uh, that's got to be a good thing. Um, scrolling down, we see the, uh, the liabilities. Um, in terms of the current liabilities, things they have to pay soon, the biggest number is their suppliers, kind of what we'd expect. Um, and they also have a few lease liabilities. So there's the short-term lease liabilities and the long-term lease liabilities. And these lease liabilities, we should match to uh, the number that we saw earlier. We can just scroll up and see it. Um, there it is. So the, uh, so the right of use assets, which we're kind of pointing out about now. Uh, so uh, we can kind of, um, you know, match those, those lease liabilities against uh, the, uh, the, 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 the lease, um, uh, uh, the, the leased assets effectively. Just to, you just got to bring them onto the balance sheet these days. Um, so trade and other payables, otherwise not a lot in terms of our current, um, current liabilities, comparing the current liabilities to the current assets. Uh, liquidity really isn't a problem. Um, they've got, you know, easily enough um, where they can almost pay all of their supplies just with the cash in the bank. So, um, you know, liquidity really not an issue. Uh, surprisingly, loans really low. Look at that. Um, only 76 million of actual loans. So a lot of lease liabilities. That's fine. That used to be what we would call off balance sheet financing. Obviously, it's been had to be brought onto the balance sheet um, under the latest IFRS guidance. Um, uh, but really, these guys, they don't have a lot of let debt. 
funding the business, what they do is that they have leases that allows them to buy their um, their capital expenditure assets. Um, so that's really it. Uh, and, and, and so their net assets of 10 billion um, is represented by their equities. There's the net assets of 10 billion. That's the assets less the liabilities. So theoretically, uh, uh, if you put the company into liquidation, you'd end up with 10 billion on the cash pile, which would be given back to the shareholders. There it is. Um, and uh, we can see, you know, the retain this is mainly funded through retained earnings. So this is very much a company that has been making profits and those profits have been reinvested back into the business. These numbers up here, um, this is the kind of, um, uh, this, is, this is the sort of uh, what the shareholders are physically put in. So this is very much a retained profits business. Okay, so the balance sheet looking pretty strong. Um, no debt, interest isn't a problem. Uh, it's all looking pretty good to me. Um, if we look at the movement in equity, which is just down here, we'll have a look at that. Um, we can see um, the, uh, so here's the, the, the profit coming through. Um, we're looking at this, uh, this column here. Um, and uh, if we, uh, if I just get onto the right page, here we go. Um, so we're looking at this column here um, and we can see, actually quite interesting. So this is the previous year. So we've got the profit figure from the previous year. There's the profit figure. Um, and you can see they're paying out dividends, 271 million. Um, and then if we continue down that screen to this year, they are making a profit of 478 million. But interestingly enough, the dividend went down. Now, I'm not sure why that dividend would have gone down. Maybe it was kind of in reaction to the pandemic. And it's like, we need to keep a little bit more cash um, in the business. So they've dropped the dividend, but there's no obvious reason why that dividend can't come back to its, its previous level. So, um, you know, two, 200 million, if you're making 450 million profit, you pay a 200 million dividend, uh, that should be sustainable on an ongoing basis. Here, they're making nearly 500 million profit, um, and they just dropped their dividend to 50 million. Um, so again, I'm not familiar what their dividend strategy is, um, but it's certainly, if they wanted to bring it back, I, I don't think that that's going to be an issue. They're not like some of these companies who um, <coughs> drop their dividends um, because they just can't afford to carry on paying uh, that kind of level anymore. Last one is the cash flow statement. So here's the cash flow statement, um, and we see very, very strong cash flow, first of all. So here we go. Um, uh, regular viewers will know this is my favorite number. Um, this is the net cash generated from operating activities. Another word effectively for their cash profit. It's the cash equivalent of their operating profit. These guys are generating a lot of cash. Um, and a lot of that cash is driven uh, through this, um, uh, the fact that they've got this depreciation. Depreciation is, of course, a non-cash expense. So generating lots of cash, um, and they're generating easily, first of all, enough cash to be able to pay for their capex. So this is the investment, and there's a lot of investment going on, so that's good. Um, interesting enough, the investment, sometimes we like to kind of compare the investments with the depreciation. So the investment is a little bit less than the depreciation, uh, and that's a kind of consistent story. So um, we might be a little bit kind of alarm bells. Are they allowing themselves to sort of shrink? Um, uh, just want to make sure um, uh, that they are, uh, you know, they're investing, replacing and growing the business. Um, but they are able to afford their investment plan at the moment. And not only that, but they are paying down their debt. So here we've got the, um, the, the, the repayment of leases. Um, uh, they're paying their interest. Um, there is the dividends will be in there. There's the dividends that we uh, observed earlier, not issuing any shares. They're not raising any money. They're not issuing debt they're not raising debt they're pretty much debt free they've got these leases they're paying down their leases that's absolutely fine that'll be part of their kind of ongoing uh calculation that they buy a uh buy a you know buy a piece of machinery and then use the income that machinery generates in order to repay the lease on that machinery so that'll be um uh you know all well managed what looks pretty well managed in the business uh, and that effectively uh, equates to an increase in cash during the year of 340 million, uh, 600 million in the previous year. Um, and you can see they're now sitting on over 2 billion in cash. So summary is these guys have lots of cash. Um, I guess the only warning light would be possibly this number here. 
does it look a little bit like are they under investing um uh, maybe not maybe it's um uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're happy with their, their, their current status. There's no reason for them to underinvest. They've got enough cash. Um, maybe they've got, you know, all their assets are, are performing uh, correctly and they don't need to kind of embark on any replacement program. And that is effectively the numbers. And, and there's really nothing else that kind of jumps out to me. This looks like a pretty, you know, a pretty good company. EBITDA margin, 12%. Um, they don't have, you know, any debt, for example liquidity is not a problem cash flow is pretty strong um their, their their working capital requirement if you want to work that out it's about 30 days um but they've got easily enough working capital very very strong solid balance sheet just you know really these guys are ticking all the boxes that we like uh, from a well-run um uh, well-run business so it is it is it's marginally profitable but and if you know, be like Associated British Foods, if you're going to operate in a company in a in a in an industry which is you know razor thin margins, it's not a problem. But you've just got to run a really really tight ship uh, and have a very strong balance sheet that's sitting behind you. Uh, and I think that you know these guys certainly are. That's certainly what all the numbers are telling me. So let's go and have a look at the um, share price now. Quite interesting here, as we mentioned, uh, as you mentioned, Moeed. Um, the share price has gone all the way up and then all the way back down again. Um, uh, you can see some sort of key. So, so there's the pandemic, for example, um, uh, and you know, sort of a big drop off, and then everyone's going to be eating foods, and then the, then a continued slide. Um, and, and quite interesting that you know. So, first of all, let's look at these numbers. So, the market cap. So, these guys are about twelve point four five market cap. You'll remember. Um, uh, hopefully that the um, balance sheet, um, the net assets was about 10 billion. So if you pay 12 billion for a 10 billion company, um, you're paying a very small amount of kind of inherent goodwill, so to speak. So it's only trading at a small premium to its book value, which to me looks, you know, not unreasonable if I can use a double negative in there. P ratio 15 times earnings is, is not screaming cheap, but it's not screaming expensive either. I think the um, uh, the long term P ratio or the CAPE of the uh, S and P in the U S is fifteen times, and recently it's been trading on thirty times, and everything's blowing up and and, and coming down again. So P ratio fifteen times, just so that we understand what that means, um, is that if you kind of turn it the other way up. Uh, it's about a six to seven percent yield. So the earnings is yielding you about six to seven percent, which I think looks pretty good. Um, the dividend yield, pretty low, two percent. But then, as we mentioned, they've dropped the dividend. There's no reason why that dividend shouldn't come back. Uh, and so these guys, uh, you know, if that is their strategy, uh, should be able to pay a reasonable dividend. Now, so where is it going next? Is this a kind of a buy? Have they hit a floor here? Are we sitting there thinking, actually, this is cheap? Nobody likes the dot-com stocks, and now it's going to bounce up, and it's going to kind of do this. Or is it going to carry on doing this? Or are we just going to kind of go sideways here? So that's the kind of the big question, obviously. And if I knew that, I wouldn't be sitting here, Moeed. But the kind of speculative, you know, these guys are going to come under pressure from inflation okay so their input we looked at their tight margin very very tight margin um and their ability to pass that inflation on is going to be crucial now i think because they're kind of dealing in very staples because they're very kind of they're they're kind of you know in the essential part i think that they're going to be able to do that so you take primark for example primark very much built on volume it's cheap uh, and it's volume based, um, you know, and if they need to squeeze and put the shirts up from, you know, a pound to a pound 20, you know, then they're going to be able to do that because there's not a lot of all alternatives um, uh, for, you know, buying little Johnny's pair of socks and, uh, and pants, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that, you know, these guys should be reasonably able to pass, um, uh, pass on the prices in inflation. Um, so they're not cheap, but they're not expensive. Um, they're looking pretty solid. I think they're going to, you know, it, it's a, it, it's clearly a well-run business. Um, I, I'm not, it's not part of my portfolio, full disclosure, um, uh, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be part of my portfolio. So let's put it like that. It's not a screaming buy. It's not a screaming avoid. It looks like it's a, 
it's a it's a good solid part of a, of a portfolio it's not going to double and double and double again um but it doesn't look like it's going to go to zero either so there you go moe that is my take on associated british foods i hope you found that um useful and informative yeah so certainly certainly did and i'm sure our listeners and viewers did too it'll be interesting to see how they weather any recession if the recession does come round as you said they will be pretty resilient groceries and food ingredients and things like that tend to be and even with the with the retailer primark you know a lot of uh, consumers in recession tend to flow more towards the discount retailers uh, in, including primark so i think they might be resilient we'll wait and see how that works out so what did you all think um you know would love to hear your thoughts this is a community at the end of the day please leave your polite comments and thoughts in the comment section below 98% of the companies that we analyze actually come from our viewers and subscribers. So if you do have a company that you're thinking about either selling to, investing in, working for, whatever it might be, um, you know, do leave a note in the comment section, leave some context behind that. The more context and more interesting your context, the quicker you, we will analyze your company, release it. And if you're a subscriber, you will get a notification of when we, re when we release your company analysis. So uh, until the next video, thank you, Ted. Thank you, everyone else. We'll see you soon. Good to speak to you, Mary. Catch you later.